This Week in Parasitism is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twip. This Week in Parasitism, episode number 94, recorded on September 2nd, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and with me is Dixon de Pommier. Hello, Vincent. And Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Thank, Thank you. you. When, when do you guys think was the last time we recorded uh, a- It was a while back. <laughs> it was a while back. I think back. it was- July. In July, Yes. It had to be because I left on July 16th, and I don't know. Daniel, when did you leave? I didn't leave till early August. Early August. Did you have a good uh, journey, Daniel? You went to Africa and Peru? No, just, just Peru I this you time. You to Africa. You I, got, I got to go to Africa in the next month or two. <laughs> did you treat patients in Peru? Oh, I, I had wonderful two weeks in Peru at the Tropical Medicine Institute in Lima, yeah. and I saw fantastic cases. And a lot of the patients had treatable diseases. How about that? Yeah, someday you will tell us about them. Definitely. Oh. What did you do, Dixon? You traveled around the U.S. My wife and I drove our now currently three-year-old Prius station wagon. How many miles from, do, you have? do you have? We've got 62,000 miles on it now. So we yeah. drove it out on the fourth day that we bought it three years ago out west. When I say west, I mean Montana. And mm. we repeated the trip, only we varied it this time. We went through the Black Hills. We went through the Badlands. We nice. saw Mount Rushmore. We saw the, saw the Devil's Tower. We went fishing in Sheridan, Wyoming. We did a whole bunch of stuff. Had a great time. Did you see Denali? <laughs> they renamed Mount McKinley. I know, I know. <laughs> no, we didn't get that far north. I did a little sailing last week. Did oh, you did? My son. Yeah, okay. We took the boat out okay. four or five times. It was fun. I right. actually came back early enough to get in some sailing last week, you and guys. it was, I love sailing. Do you, do you agree with my tenet, which is there will always be wind? <laughs> there will always, as long what, as this show is on the air, yes. What do you, what do you mean by that? <laughs> it means you go out, you can, all of a sudden the wind can die, but eventually, at some time of day, it will pick up again. So you, Look, you don't need a motor, you don't need oars. If the earth turns, will eventually there will get be in. wind. No, and, and I think I think what you're saying is true, it, particularly if you know the area. Like, uh, in the evenings, there's almost always in this area this sea yeah, breeze that will come absolutely. in. Absolutely. So you should read the rhyme of the ancient mariner to make sure that there well, will always be wind. Well, I know if you're out at sea, you might not get wind. But we, <laughs> yeah. near the coast, you oh, and we sail in a bay, which is maybe yeah. two miles across. Right. There's always wind. Because right. we have never had a, a wind problem. And then last week, the last time we went out, it was a great wind offshore. We zipped right out, and then we got in huh. the middle and died. Slack. Absolute glass Arc. water, you know. There's nothing, oh. and my son and and wife are just like impatient. We should have brought the oars. We should get a motor. I said, "You guys are not sailors. Just sit, enjoy the ocean. <laughs> yeah. Eventually, the wind will come." Yeah. And I'm looking over the bow. You know, maybe a half hour later, I see the water starting to ripple. I said, of "Wind's course, coming." Of course, of course. And it came. Well, Christopher I, Columbus's <laughs> men almost mutinied on the way over because they hit the same deal. I understand. At sea with a big ship. Right. He's a little guy. And you know what he was doing? Hey, those he was just little... rocking the rudder back and forth, and that's, that pushes you forward. Yeah, it does. Yes. Although it, does. it takes a long time. I, think, I guess. I think they were just jealous at all the motorboats <laughs> going by. <right? laughs> this episode of TWIP is brought to you by ASM Education Department. They would like you to know about a publishing and writing webinar series that uh -huh. they are sponsoring. And this is for graduate students, postdocs, and early career scientists, so none of us. None of us. But many <laughs> listeners may be interested. Uh, Daniel might qualify here. It is called the ASM Scientific Writing and Publishing Webinar Series. It is a three-month, six-part program from January to March of 2016. And what you will do in this webinar series is to learn from some of the journal editors of ASM about the writing and publishing process, how to do titles and abstracts, figures and legend, the manuscript review process, and many, many other things, how you craft everything so that your paper will get accepted and so forth. So this is fo focused on writing scientific papers. And uh, you can apply to get into this 
uh, you should go to the website. It's a little bit complicated, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash S-W-P. I O N line. So S W I P I online 15. We'll put the link in the show notes. The deadline is December 1st. Mm -hmm. ASM education. Let's begin with a review of the TWIP 93 case. Yes, we're up to TWIP 94. We are quickly approaching 100. You know, as we approach, it gets slower. <laughs> is well, that asymptotic. Is that I it's hope not. asymptotic. I, no, no, no. We're I, about to pick it up again. I the think wind this is was, increasing. <laughs> <laughs> I think this been. was a little bit of a hiatus here, and now we're going to go But you're going to Africa correct. again. Correct. You're going to be gone for a we'll, we'll t- Yeah. And, we, and then I'm going to be in <laughs> India. You know what we'll have to do? We're going to have to Skype me in. Oh, yeah. Skype me in. People do that, yeah. Okay. Let me remind everybody of case... The case from our last TWIP. And this was a, and I have my notes too. <laughs> this was a 39 year old gentleman who emigrated from um, El Salvador in 2002 and he presented to the outpatient infectious disease clinic. And he had a number of complaints. He had constipation on and off. He felt that his throat was hurting. At times it felt like it was closing when he lies flat. He also reported irritation of his skin, his upper chest, and his arms that had been going on for many years. And um, what brought him to us, people may remember, is he tried to donate blood and was told um, that he had an abnormal test and was rejected for donation and referred to our clinic. Hmm. An abnormal test. An abnormal test. Abby normal. (laughs) All right. We have had one, two, three... Lots of time for four, follow-ups. five, six, yeah. six responses. Okay, not bad for August. That isn't bad at all. First one is from Elise, which is the, so this is in the order in which they came in. Mm-hmm. Dear Twip Trifecta, how are you? And yeah, we're well, thank you. Yeah, we are good. It's lovely here in Lower Manhattan, 82F, 27C, with blue skies and not much in the way of humidity to make things wilt. As opposed to today. It's quite humid, isn't it? It's very humid. It's about 32C here. And warm. That's Mm -hmm. right. Since you are all going on the road, not me, I didn't go on the road, I'll be on the edge of my seat waiting to hear about the patient from TWIP 93, and here's my diagnosis. I believe the patient has Chagas disease. Hmm. There are two phases of the disease, acute and chronic, but people often don't develop the acute symptoms or they pass the, and the disease becomes chronic and unnoticed until other symptoms develop. It can take quite a number of years before chronic infections reveal themselves. Chronic Chagas infections can lead to a wide range of problems, including cardiac damage, digestive problems, difficulty mm-hmm. swallowing, mm-hmm. nervous system problems, and even dementia. The patient has been feeling pretty well, but his low-level complaints are consistent with a chronic Chagas infection. His intermittent constipation is probably the result of digestive tract problems caused by Chagas disease. Chagas is apparently the cause of a large percentage of the cases of chronic megacolon in Central and South America. I think I saw a megacolon at the Mutter Museum in Philadelphia. (laughs) It is very hard to know how someone could get around town with that. Since he spent a large portion of his life in El Salvador... Where Chagas is common, it makes sense that this is something he contracted when he was living there and now continues to harbor it. In addition, his difficulty with the feeling of his throat closing when he lies down and his sore throat are also consistent with chronic Chagas disease, which can also lead to mega esophagus, which sounds extremely dangerous and hard to live with as well. His rash can also be a symptom of Chagas disease and his description of it that is not hugely bothersome and comes and goes intermittently is also consistent, but most descriptions I've found suggest that the rash is more of an early symptom of the disease. I assume that until the blood bank referred him to his physician, he would have been content to live with these symptoms since they aren't really interfering with his life, but now that he knows what's going on, he should get rid of the parasite before it can cause more damage. Has his heart been damaged at all? What is the best way to treat a patient with this chronic an infection, and will he be able to recover? I hope you all have wonderful August excursions and come back with all kinds of stories. Until you return, I will have to track down case studies and diagnostic riddles wherever I can find them. <laughs> Many thanks and best wishes. All right. Um, can you take the next one, uh, Daniel, from Mark? Mark writes, It is 37 degrees centigrade in Oklahoma today, and humidity feels quite high. Mm. I live in the American South, so I am extra interested in the 39-year-old El Salvadorian American's case. 
There has been some concern that the disease described may be endemic in warmer climate areas of the U.S. I am guessing the patient has the symptoms of American trypanosomiasis or Chagas disease. The rash and the constipation and upper GI strictures are symptomatic of this disease due to thickening of smooth muscle tissue of colon and GI tract. American trypanosomiasis has recently been added to the CDC list of blood-borne pathogens screened for in the U.S. Problem is that the blood bank refers patients diagnosed with this disease to physicians, and patients may be asymptomatic, and physicians lacking familiarity with the disease may not notify CDC for treatment advice. Treatment advice from CDC includes free medication. Mm -hmm. and that is true. They will walk you right through it. Also, in some locales, physicians may not refer patients to infectious disease physici physicians. The symptoms do not only include what was described in Daniel's case, but can also include cardiomyopathy. I am a clinical pharmacy coordinator, and I'm trying to get the news out regarding Chagas disease to physicians who practice at my hospital. Hmm. Chagas disease may sound rare and unknown, but I have seen a cone nose kissing bug of the variety described in Chagas disease reviews at my residence. Uh -huh. Also, where I live, we are blessed with a Hispanic American and migrant worker community, some who are recently from Latin America. Thanks for this interesting case. Clarification on guess of diagnosis, megacolon results from dilation of colon due to nerve damage and decreased smooth muscle tone, and same happens to esophagus. Difficulty swallowing is a symptom that can cause malnutrition in patients. Mm -hmm. And then he gives us a link to a fact sheet. Right. Dixon de Pombier. Lee writes... Dear Twip, I'm a long-time listener and lover of your podcast, but I've never written. So, hello. The combination of a skin rash with intestinal problems, along with the fact that the problem was identified during blood donor screening, leads me to a diagnosis of Chagas disease, Trypanosoma cruzi. This is consistent with the patient's history of living in rural Central America, where both the trypanosome and its kissing bug host are endemic. As you pointed out on a previous TWIP, rural South and Central America houses with houses with thatch, thatched roofs are perfect habitat for T. cruzi's triatomian vector. An immunological test for Chagas antibodies would confirm the diagnosis. Alternatively, a microscopic evaluation of a blood sample should show the presence of trypanosomes. Furthermore, the patient's file, specifically his mother's heart attack history, suggests that other members of his family may be affected by the parasite and should be screened. Treatment with antiparasitic drugs will not entirely eliminate the patient's parasite load, but may improve his quality of life and reduce his risk for further complications from the disease. The weather in Portland is hot, 27C, sunny and dry. This is not what I expected when I moved to the Pacific Northwest. I'm hoping it cools down by the time your next podcast rolls around. Hope you're all enjoying your August holidays, Lee. All right. So far, th three shagas, right? Correct. With several uh, minor corrections to the thing that I just read, by the way. I'd like to go sure. back to it later. SJ writes, hello, TWIP team. It's currently 32C with scattered clouds here in the beautiful eastern Sierra. <laughs> Unfortunately, very smoky due to forest fires. Hmm. Watching the Perseid meteor showers is difficult this year as a result of all the smoke. Being from El Salvador and <laughs> due to being rejected as a blood donor, my first thought was Chaga's disease for this episode's case study. At work, we were discussing the insect vector diseases that are threatening to cross the border from Mexico, and the subject of T. cruzi being included in the blood donation screen was brought up. In some cases, Chaga's causes enlargement of the colon, and the esophagus, which may be the root of the patient's bowel and swallowing problems. The rash is also indicative of Chagas, although I understand that to be more of an acute phase symptom than a chronic phase symptom. Lastly, Dr. Griffin mentioned that his facility has become the local experts on the disease in question. Mm -hmm. I believe I recall him mentioning in previous episodes that they had become a Chagas disease center of sorts. Oh, good memory, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully the patient doesn't suffer from cardiac damage as well. Thanks, as always, for putting together these wonderful podcasts. All right, Daniel. Dr. Wink writes, the man from El Salvador, as a protozoology major in college, OSU let me create my own wow. major, I'd better get this one. I say <laughs> Chagas disease. I suspect megacolon and achalasia, but I don't remember anything about a rash. Can't wait for you to resume podcasting to hear the discussion. Wink Weinberg. Wow. Dr. Wink. Wow. All right, Dixon. David writes, Dear Daniel, Vincent, and Dixon, 
I was disheartened to learn my guess of the Salmon tapeworm, which doesn't make it on time to be aired, sparing me some minor embarrassment, was the incorrect diagnosis, but Anasakis was indeed my second guess, so that gives me a bit more confidence. As for my guess regarding the 39-year-old immigrant from El Salvador, I was quite puzzled as to this particular condition of symptoms, including skin irritation, throat closure, constipation, and rejected blood. After much research, I will venture the guess that this is Chagas disease brought on by Trypanosoma cruzi. This parasite enters the bloodstream through the bite of a reduvid bug affectionately called the kissing bug. This protozoan parasite causes the megacolon symptom, which manifests as constipation and causes skin lesions manifesting in his irritation. The patient's trouble swallowing also points to Chagas disease, and I am assuming the patient was denied blood donation due to the discovery of trypomast tripomasticotes in the bloodstream. The weather in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts is 62 degrees Fahrenheit, a nice respite from the interesting heat wave Massachusetts has been enduring a rather fitting fate after the nor'easter that slammed the region this winter. Best wishes, David. Okay. Well then. Everyone guessed Chagas. They did. So, so it's unanimous. They must be correct. I don't know. Not necessarily. <laughs> that's right. This is a diagnosis by vote. <laughs> is that, that's the way it works. Is this something that you could easily Google and figure out, Daniel? I, th- I, th- I think you could. Um, yeah. But no, I would like to think that we just have a very sharp... <laughs> we have, we've um, educated them to the point now that there is, they're up to speed. How's that? Yeah, I think that is... With I a think few exceptional tweaks. Daniel, what is the key uh, suggester here that would... I, I think the biggest is. hint um, would be that he was rejected when he tried to donate blood. Mm-hmm. The second is the fact that he's from El Salvador. And then the third are the symptoms. And, you know, I I pick these cases in part because I think each case has something special Mm -hmm. um, that I enjoyed about it. And if the person had come in with an abnormal EKG, that would have been, I think, Mm -hmm. more classic for what people think about. Um, And that was why I didn't present, you know, one of those cases, which we've seen many of. But to say that this man did have Chagas disease. And... um, the the initial test he got back from the blood bank said mm-hmm. you know you're positive for T cruzi. Which what kind of test is that, by the way? It's it's a serology. Um, okay. So you're looking for antibodies. Got it. And actually, at this point, we'll we'll try to kind of go I think back through some of the emails because I think people had some great things in the emails with little say sort of okay. slight variance from um, from maybe the truth. Uh, <laughs> As we slight know inaccuracies, it. let's say. <laughs> right. Um, but no. So um, he he gets this test back that he is a positive antibody um, screen for T. cruzi. And it's a screening test. So there's a, there's a rule that we have when you diagnose Chagas disease that you want two positive serologies, two mm-hmm. positive um, separate antibody tests. That test from the blood bank, it doesn't count, right? Because it's a, it's a broad screening test. It's very sensitive. It's not as specific as we'd like. So this gentleman actually goes ahead and gets two more serological tests. Um, one of them was actually done at the CDC. They both were positive. Um, uh-huh. So now, now you run up with the, well, what do we do with his symptoms? How do we put this all together? And so I sort of wanted to go through. Um, Can I just interrupt yes. a moment? Did they actually look for the trypanosome? No, they didn't. And usually at this stage, you're, you're usually not going to find the trypanosomes. And so maybe we need to break down into what are the stages mm-hmm. of Chagas disease. And we had some people talk about this. There's the acute stage of Chagas disease. And, and we should talk about how they actually get it. Because I noticed uh, yeah. Dixon and I yeah, cringed right. a little. Because um, Chagas disease is a unique vector-borne disease. When you get a vector-borne disease, how do you get it? You get bitten by the vector, right? right like a mosquito like born, a mosquito, mosquito bite bites you, or a fly bite. Gives you a little blood that has a virus in it, right? Yeah. Into the injection site, right? Right. Like right. malaria, for instance. Yeah. But, but there are some notable exceptions. This happens to be one. This is a notable exception. Yeah. And in this case... How notable is that exception? <laughs> <laughs> so, has- and, and this is great because we're getting a nice chronology. How, how right. do you catch this thing? Right. And it's actually the infective form is in the reduvid bug, in the vector, in the triatome bug's Mm -hmm. feces. Right. And what you don't want to do is get that feces in contact with an open wound or a mucous membrane. Exactly. And what happens classically is a person is sleeping in a, a thatched roof, rural hut. 
the bugs are living in there. They're living up in the mm -hmm. thatched area. A person is sleeping. Most of, them is, most of them are covered, so the face might be what's exposed. The bug goes ahead and, and puts some feces on your face. So it lands on your face. They land on your face because it's exposed. They're there to take a blood meal. Okay. Often, not always, but often when they take the blood meal, they'll then... Um, <laughs> Defecate. Defecate. Yes. Well, <laughs> the blood actually pushes the defecation event the out of the gut tract of the uh, insect. Okay. The trypanosomes, when they develop in the tri triatomid, do not develop in the hemocele in the in the blood space of mm. the of the bug. They are actually all self-contained in the in the uh, digestive tract. Got it. From start to finish, unlike a lot of so others that we've a, discussed. And then you scratch your face and it, push and the feces into it, the wound. It right? has an agent that it injects that actually induces that. Scratching, itching, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so <laughs> it's it's incredibly reinforcing in terms of the biology. And these these so these bugs are huge, right? And they're enormous. They're, they're enormous. Actually, I, I brought like some... These two are, inch two bugs inches. are not a problem to yeah. see. Yeah. So oh, these, are, really these are some scary. redeer bugs I, Very I brought. Scary. A, a picture I brought back right. from... From but South you know America. what? But they're quite <laughs> this, beautiful, this also trip. in their own way. And those are these things are about the size of your thumb. These these right. are big bugs. That's right. And so yeah, so they land on your face typically, and they excrete, but they don't always excrete. Yeah, so they, there'll be reduba bug feces on the walls of people's dwellings, so you can actually recognize <sighs> that the the home is infested. Right. But so you you rub, and you either rub that feces into the wound, right. or more classically, you rub it into your eye, and then it's going to come in. Um, through the conjunctiva. And that's when you end up with the classic. Indeed, Romagna's sign. Yes, I, I have pronunciation <laughs> problems, so I was deferring there. Um, and you do, the, the child often will rub it into there, and you end up with this large, inflamed, indurated area that takes actually several weeks to resolve. Sure. People usually remember this, because you know, this a bug bite, you think, of, oh, I got true. a bug bite, it was swollen, it went away. This is, I, they usually yeah. attribute it to a bug mm. bite. It's more like a cellulitis. It, really, it's a, quite a swelling. So we used to hmm. pause at that moment, <laughs> and Dr. Harold <laughs> okay. Brown used to say, class, what is the difference between a sign and a symptom? Yeah, of course. Remember we so, had this discussion on TWIV because we, someone called we, us out? I'm, I'm sure they did. Yeah, so yeah, in yeah. this case, this is a sign because this is something that a doctor can actually see and make a diagnosis from. A symptom is the way the patient feels, and they have to relate that to the it doctor. It has to be related right? by the so, patient. Right? Is so that this, correct, Dan? Did you get it right? It's close. Symptom is some, what you some, can talk about, yeah. right? Symptoms are what patients tell you. Signs are what you see. So do some mice, symptoms are visible. Do mice have symptoms? <laughs> some are. <laughs> some symptoms are visible. Well, it well, presents that, as a that sign, a, though, don't you think? <laughs> exactly. Isn't that a sign? So does, yeah. a mouse yeah. does not have symptoms, right? Because it can't tell you what's wrong with it. But it can behave like it has symptoms. <laughs> well, it has but signs. But then there would be a sign, then, wouldn't yeah, it? Okay. <laughs> yes. Got it. Yes. So if you, the, the rule here is when you wake up in the morning, do not scratch. Do not rub well, feces into your eyeballs. Guess what? You do this in your sleep. <laughs> I was going to say, you probably do it in your sleep, right? You yeah. That, yeah, that may very well be true. You probably have a dream that someone is tickling your face, and in your dream, you're yeah, scratching. You start this scratching, is why the yeah. bug is also called the kissing bug. Why is that? Because it goes on your face and kisses you. Yeah, There's another biting. name for it, too, though. It's called the assassin bug. Because, assassin bug? Yeah, because... You're gonna die. <laughs> when like, that happens, you're gonna die. I like reduvid. A reduvid. Where I had a guy from Os, uh, Argentina who used to call it reduvido. Reduvido. Oh, yeah. He ought to know. Yeah. He ought to know. <laughs> reduvido. This is true. I love it. It really yeah. flows nicely yeah. off the tongue. In fact, Charles Darwin, in his original voyages, went to Valparaiso and then climbed up through the Andes to overlook the. Amazon Basin, mm -hmm. and he had to sleep up there. And when he did, he said he woke up covered with reduvid bugs. Did he scratch them? <laughs> he was just freaked out by them because it was, I think it was the first time he ever saw them. And then after that, everyone thought that Darwin was suffering from Chagas disease, basically, because it's a long-term onset disease, and he yeah, was yeah, suffering yeah. from digestive disorders and heart disease-like symptoms and things like this over the next 20 years of his life. But he, he he never had it diagnosed. So he was sleeping outside. Uh, no, he was indoors, and it was in a like a hut that they okay. built for him. And the reduvid bugs just. Did you ever have a reduvid on your face? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know of. But then again, it happens when you're asleep. So how would you know? It happens very quickly too, and they they consume a huge amount of blood. So you never wake up with them on your face. Usually not. 
They're stealth they're biters, dire, aren't they? No, you, they're you, nocturnal so you, feeders. So actually, they're nocturnal feeders, baby. You, you can you can wake you wake up in the middle of the night occasionally, right? Yeah, so yeah. so I all so the time. I, occasionally I do <laughs> all the time. I'm up. <laughs> no, so there was a story. It was a it was through a colleague of mine. They were down in South America yeah. and they were with another infectious disease doc and they were doing some um, medical missionary type work. And the person, you know, woke up with a reduvid bug. And, oh, were right. they excited? They put it in a bag. They <laughs> right. wanted to do all kinds sure, of testing. Sure, 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 sure. So uh, this fellow came to the U.S. in 2002. So, this so is let's, 13 yeah, we years should, later. Yes, yeah, so we probably need to continue. So there is yeah. this. We, we've just gotten to the point where somebody has rubbed feces into their wound or their eyeball. And then a certain percentage of the time, and I'm going to be vague there because I think that this isn't as well studied as we like. A certain percent of the time, you develop an acute illness that lasts for a couple months. And during that acute illness, a, I will say, a, clearly a minority of people get really ill. Mm-hmm. And by really ill, they can develop acute inflammation of their heart. Mm-hmm. They can die. They can um, get acute inflammation of their meninges in their brain, acute meningoencephalitis. They also can get destruction of the autonomic nervous system. They can then either die, as we mentioned, or they can recover, or they can be treated, which we think makes a difference. And then they go into this period of time we call the indeterminate phase, Mm -hmm. sometimes called chronic. I like indeterminate better because we're we're not really sure what's happening at this point or where it's going to go. And during this period of time that can last 10 to 20 years, a couple things can happen. There still are living parasites, Mm -hmm. and that's key. You, it's it's like chicken pox or like one of those herpes cold sores we get. It we don't. Doesn't go away. It doesn't it does go, go away. away. And we, where are these located in the bloodstream? Tissues. Uh, in tissues, um, they can and in lots of tissues. They can be in the heart. They may actually be in the skin. They could be in a number of different CNS. places. They can. And at that point, they don't look like the trypanosome. Mm-hmm. Rather, they look like leishmania. Because they're intracellular. In this case, though, Trypanosoma cruzi has the ability to actually crawl into the cytoplasm, directly mm-hmm. into the cytoplasm, with no membranes surrounding it. It becomes another subcellular particle, basically, and that for that reason, host defense mechanisms are all negated, which allows this parasite to really succeed beyond its wildest dreams. And the dreams. reason it's not co- is not cleared is because it undergoes antigenic variation um, to evade? No, it doesn't need to. It, 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 it disappears from the, from the host's uh, me, innate immune system. Are those the guys that do that antigenic variation? No, these are not the ones. The ones in Africa are the ones that do that. T. T. Brucei. Brucei. This okay. is T. Cruzi. Cruzi doesn't do I know that. they're related, but they're Got distantly it. related. So these are only in South America? Correct. And Central America. Do we have them in the U.S.? Yes, we do. Do we have the bugs in the U.S.? Yes, we do. Wow. But who gets but we them? don't have thatched huts. <laughs> but who gets the infections? That's what you need to ask. Who gets the infections? Dogs, Dogs. and other domestic <laughs> pets because these reduvids, unlike the ones in Central and South America, do not have sloppy table manners. That is to say, they don't defecate on their host when they, do, when they feed. Okay, Their gut tracts may be longer or they may take less blood. We don't know the answer to that. Huh. But the way the dog gets it is it, it sees the bug biting it and it reaches down and grabs the bug and eats, eats it. it. Yeah. And at that point, the trypanosomes now gain entrance into the mucous membranes and of infect course. the dog. So North American uh, reduvids don't defecate when they take a blood meal. That is the difference. And huh. that's the reason why people don't get the infection. They get bitten by the bugs, but there's no feces on their skin. So wait yeah. a minute. We missed one minor well, that, or I several is, major was, transmission no, this cycles. Is a, this is a great segue. So a couple of things. We have had... People in the U.S., there's a famous case of a guy from Montana Mm -hmm. who ended up with Chagas disease. His blood got rejected. He he went initially in the 90s to donate blood. All was good. And then he goes to donate again, and we'll get into when they start screening. And now they say, oh, we've got to reject your blood, Mm -hmm. and it gets checked at the CDC, and he's got Chagas disease. Never left the U.S. The story was, as a kid... He went to summer camp in southern Texas. Bingo. And bingo. so he, and, and that is the interesting, as we said, the parasites can invade through the mucous membranes. Now, our, our eyeballs are not the only place where we have mucous membranes. We're all mm-hmm. mucous membranes. Well, our mouth, for instance. Yeah. Yep. So if you eat, if you ingest, if you get reduvid bug feces or these infective forms in your mouth, and there are a couple well, um, publicized outbreaks in Brazil yes. where people, they're crushing up the sugar cane 
mm. and there's reduvid bugs in there, and it gets all crushed, and then people consume this unpasteurized mm. fruit mm. drink. Got it. And they end up getting Chagas. So how did so this cool. guy get it in southern Texas? Some um, contaminated stuff? They assume Little somehow. kids put stuff in their mouth all the time. <laughs> Who knows what? Uh, all right, so the, the, the moral is when you have crushed sugar cane, you have to put rum in it. <laughs> you have to put rum or just pasteurize it, yeah. That's right. Or let someone else drink it first. No, I can't do that. <laughs> Okay, yeah. and I guess, and I also want to leave before we go into the intermittent. I want to make a point, and I was thinking of you, Vincent, when I was driving in today and, and thinking about these things. The intermediate indeterminate, we'll call that the indeterminate phase. I mentioned that during this acute phase, you can have a lot of nerve damage done. Mm-hmm. And when I was on Colorado, we'd see a lot of people with post polio syndrome. Mm. And they were people who had a lot of nerve damage done when they were younger, but then they were fine until they got to a certain age Mm -hmm. when they needed that reserve. And then they started having issues walking. And we think that during this acute phase is when a lot of the nerve damage occurs that can later predispose you to the gastrointestinal manifestations. Mm -hmm. Over time, you gradually lose... um, some of the nerves and the nerve supply of your intestines. Sure. And if your set point has now been dropped through yeah, this acute right. infection, right. 30 years later, you may start to lose enough that you lose the ability mm-hmm. to contract, you get the megacolon, et cetera. Yeah, so unlike polio, is, which is a central <coughs> nervous system disorder, right? In it this is, case, yeah. it's myenteric plexus mm-hmm. in the intestinal tract, the ganglia that go down the length of the intestine, those are the things that get damaged the most. And that yeah. Reduces the tonus, makes it flaccid. You get megacolon, megasophagus, that sort of thing. And the parallel, right, is that there's no reason to treat, give someone an anti-polio therapy no. at this That's because right. no. it's same already, idea. Polio yeah, destroys the damage. Yeah, That's the right. damage is done. done. You don't have reserves later when you're exactly. starting to lose them. And that. That's going to be an issue in, in our gentleman here. Is can we do anything about these gastrointestinal symptoms? Right. Is that really caused from an activation? So now we have our yep. indeterminate form. Yep. It goes on for decades. Mm-hmm. And then there's a risk, and people estimate the risk is about 30% that it can actually go on and now start to cause a, a, a late stage. Mm-hmm. Um, cardiomyopathy. Cardiomyopathy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that actually, we do believe, is active parasites mm-hmm. that have not died are triggering um, a combination. Part of it is they're causing a local destruction, but part of it is an immune-mediated destruction. So those are the people that we're worried about during this indeterminate. And yeah. we call it indeterminate because if it was chronic, we'd sort of think of it always moving in that direction. But since it's a minority yeah. that yeah. will go that way, yeah. and that's where we have a lot of recommendations about treatment. The other thing I should throw in here, which is great about this case, is the skin manifestations. Mm-hmm. These are actually described, but you know, in a lot of our, we'll say, executive summaries of Chagas, it gets left out. Yep. They talk about cardiac manifestations, mm-hmm. they'll throw in the esophageal, and then they usually just sort of skip the skin. But the skin is actually, it's, um, yeah, so it's the, so often it, part of the acute, but can be part of chronic. It can so be part of the chronic? Okay. In the heart thing, the thing I picked up most from listening to other people lecture in our course to the medical mm-hmm. students, including Dr. Delisandro, was... Uh, he gave the lecture on trypanosomiasis when we used to have a lecture on that. And he described it as a right bundle branch block. And so if you're a cardiologist, you'll know exactly what that means. And then that leads to a weakening of the heart muscle, and then that leads to mega um, cardiac problems. Mm-hmm. And according to the World Health Organization, Chagas disease is the world's leading cause of cardiomyopathy, bar none, including atherosclerosis and things of this sort. So that's, this is a very serious disease. Yeah, and I think some of our email people pointed out, and I think Peter Hotez, a friend of yours, has a famous yes. quotation. There are probably, conservatively, 300,000 people in the United States right. infected with Chagas disease. That's, that's why we screen um, the right. blood mm-hmm. donors. Because right. this is not a rare disease. This is oh. actually quite common. And and I think one thing I should, should mention at this point, one thing we left out, how else can you get Chagas exactly. disease? Exactly. Count let's the say, ways. Let me count let's the ways. say our patient was a woman of childbearing years. Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we don't know whether it's 1% or 10%, but somewhere between 1% and 10% of the time, um, and it seems to be a genetic propensity for that particular mother, they can transmit it to the child. So it's good you genetic. can actually get vertical transmission. The child can be born uh, um, with Chagas disease. And if, yep. if a mother has one infected child, 
very likely that the second will be infected as well. So that's another issue. We have all these people mm -hmm. coming from these endemic areas who may end up getting pregnant. You can't treat them during the pregnancy because right. of the toxicity of the medicines, but you could potentially treat them before. Not sexually transmitted, is it? No, just vertical. So what's mm -hmm. the risk of transmission in the blood supply? I mean, you said that this guy oh. probably oh, if, didn't have it in his blood. If right? you if you actually went ahead, and this has been a this has been an issue with transfusions as well as transplants. Mm. If you went ahead and um, put this in the blood supply, you could actually infect someone who's receiving the blood. So if you've got right. a transfusion in South America and an endemic area where there's no screening, you could get Chagas disease from receiving a blood transfusion. So you remember I mentioned a long time ago in our beginning basic uh, parasitic diseases mm -hmm. uh, descriptions when we came to Chagas disease that there's a very famous gentleman in New York City, Victor Nusenzweig, mm -hmm. teaches at NYU, who became famous even before he came to this country because he's from Brazil, by discovering that if you put a 1 to 4,000 dilution of gentian violet in blood, a pint of blood, kills the trypanosomes. Is that okay so, to do? It's safe? Well, in Brazil, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here, it was uh, certainly not approved of by any IRBs, okay. but... And it, it's, it hasn't resulted in any major disease outbreak like carcinomas or anything like this as a result. <laughs> and it's prevented a lot of Chagas disease in Brazil, but it, it is not a widely used practice in this country. Yeah, what we're doing here is screening the blood supply. And the first FDA-approved FDA test to do that was introduced in 2006. And then in 2010, they came out with guidance and basically said, there's this test, why don't you start actually using it? And until that, <laughs> it's sort of interesting, until that happens, Crazy. it's sort of okay not to. So, and I think 2012, the sure. military said, oh, we should do that too. Yeah. So if you wanted to pursue this diagnosis in this gentleman to actually prove definitively that he had C. cruzi, and you took blood smear after blood smear after blood smear, and you didn't find any trypanosomes, there's one other alternative that you can do. Mm -hmm. You can get laboratory-raised reduvid bugs which are guaranteed not to contain the <laughs> organism. Right. And then you can work out a way of allowing them to feed on this person. Mm -hmm. And they will draw a lot of blood. Okay, mm -hmm. A lot meaning a mill? Two, maybe three mills okay. per bug. And then you put them in a special cage and you follow the bugs and you watch for the development of trypanosomes in the gut tract of the bugs. It's called xenodiagnosis. Mm. And it was widely practiced for a while when they were raising these bugs in captivity. And in fact, there's a very famous English entomologist whose last name matched the subject that he was working on. His last name was Wigglesworth. V.B. Yeah, Wigglesworth. That's right. And he <laughs> studied the neurology of this organism, this yeah. reduvid bug. That's what he became famous for. All right, so... Um you, you don't get enough blood in a smear to, to see it, you but the reduction pulls you enough don't. out. Usually. Yeah. And then the other, the other way of diagnosis is by taking a cardiac biopsy. Oh, great. Yeah. But if you do that, you usually <laughs> need to do PCR. And this was sort of created this uh -huh. controversy for a while. Uh -huh. where people said it's got to be all immune damage because we never see them when we do sure. a cardiac biopsy. Yeah. Yeah. Now <laughs> that they've repeated some work with PCR, they realize actually there are um, appear to be viable. Hard organisms. to see the amastigotes in those all little right. nests. So how would, how did you treat this gentleman? Ah. So this person, as I mentioned, it's a it's a recent case, and so he was being referred to GI for evaluation, and a discussion was was had about the potential treatment. So there's this would be a gentleman that we would probably want to treat, that we would probably encourage to treat, and we'll we'll talk about why. I mean, so you could say, oh, he's got all these gastrointestinal manifestations. We think they're related, <coughs> but as we talked about, it's not clear the treatment is going to help those, mm -hmm. right? There's also the observation that different strains um, of Chagas are more likely to cause the damage that leads to esophageal or more likely to lead to the cardiac yep. manifestations. He's actually characteristic. The El Salvador varieties are not commonly associated with intestinal manifestations. That's more of the South American. Um, so this person would fall into the issue of, okay, you're 39, you're under the age of 50, um, we think there's a 30% chance that he's going to go on to develop cardiac manifestations. Um, so far, he had an EKG and a transthoracic echo that were normal. And I should comment a little on the EKG. So the EKG, they recommend a 30-second rhythm strip. So what that means is you're going to basically monitor the EKG, the electrocardiogram, for 30 seconds and look for any abnormalities. 
um, things you're looking for, the first thing you'll see, as Dixon mentioned, is right bundle branch block. So the early, the first thing that gets affected is the wiring of the heart, the conduction system. It'll then go on to other blocks. The left anterior, left anterior fascicular block can develop. Ooh. You start on your, now we're going to get into our echocardiogram. <laughs> the heart wall is going to first have problems, say, during diastole. Oh, when it's trying to fill, it starts to get stiff. Later on, I saw a case of this just a couple weeks ago, yeah. you will actually start to get a dilated heart with an apical aneurysm. aneurysm. So the bottom part of the heart will actually develop an outpatch. You can get clot forming in there. And this person had developed that. Did oh, you see wow. any Chagas when you were in Peru? Yes. You did? Yes. Mm -hmm. Number of cases. And um, so what you're doing is you're trying, we don't know who the 30% are going to be. And so we try to treat, or the encouragement is to consider treatment. Unfortunately, there's no FDA-approved therapy for Chagas disease. And of the two therapies that we think work, <sighs> neither of them is 100%. They're about yeah. maybe we think 90% effective. But again, it's hard to know what effective, how you, what's your measure of effectiveness. Mm. But when you do treat them, there's a lot of side effects. Mm. Benzinidazole and nifertamox are the two. Yeah. And they, the CDC will work with you. They'll help you. But... They'll give you a free drug. Well, they'll give you free drug, but one of the one of the big issues is GI side effects. Yeah, well, skin, and it can be really severe skin, where basically the skin is sloughing off. I mean, these are not easy medications. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's it's a challenge. Big one. Did, Still. He, ta did he take anything, or did he? Not? So he hasn't started on treatment yet. So you did you offer it, and he's like thinking he's about thinking it. He's thinking about it. He's seeing the GI docs. He's going through okay. the whole process. Wow, tough. Yeah. What other errors were there that you wanted to point out here? <laughs> well, the antibody test is not a test for the presence of the organism. So it means that if it's positive, it just simply means that they've been exposed right. to the antigens, right? Got it. Whereas if they find the organism, of course, that's definitive or PCR. Okay. Uh, the other one was the route of transmission. The They're not injected. They're exactly. defecated. On, so. Injected. Yeah. Yes, okay. you're right. So those were the only two errors that I saw. I don't know about no, I think, well, the other was the way they test in the blood supply is it's an antibody test. You're not oh, actually yeah, seeing the parasites okay. in the blood. Um, the mm -hmm. one issue about, we think it's nerve damage, and that's why you're losing the ability to contract. Yeah, a good, yeah. And so that's what's leading ultimately mm -hmm. to the mega esophagus, exactly. um, the GI manifestations. But no, in general, I, th I thought we had some um, pretty sharp responses. Very and, sharp. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Dixon. I think that our, our listening public is getting educated through listening and probably doing some reading on the side. And these are some pretty sophisticated responses. I think that's I mean, great. A lot of them reveal the life cycle, the clinical manifestations, and, and, and obviously curing people with these drugs is not the way that you would try to do this on a community basis. So we do have somebody uh, who I think is still associated with Columbia University. Um, his last name is Cohn. And why am I blocking on his first name? Not Neil Cohn. It's um, he's over at Rockefeller University now, also in the Population Council. But he's done a lot of work in South America with other epidemiologists mm -hmm. because he's a population biologist. You can actually eliminate the breeding sites for the reduvid bugs by switching from these thatched roofs, which are easy for the mm. bugs to get into, and, and eliminate the pictures on the walls that hide the bugs behind them, and you know using <laughs> mm -hmm. crude building materials yeah. like mud and and uh, hay, uh, if you switch to a cinder block and tin roof, whole swatches of uh, area can be uh, eliminated mm. in terms of transmission of, of reduvids. So um, why do I, I know this And it guy. really, and it, as, as Dixon's <laughs> saying, it really, it's vector control. Um, the medicines yeah. are toxic. These yeah. are not mass drug campaign um, right. Drugs. These so, are these are toxic. You you barely want to use them. And so where we have had right. success right. is when they go in and they have vector control. So the cone region of Patagonia, which includes Chile and Argentina, mm -hmm. have been essentially um, made reduvid bug free. And as a result, that region now is Chagas free. So if you get rid of the bug, you get rid of the disease. However, what you didn't mention, which I wish yes. you had mentioned. Oh, no, you, can, you can mention it now. In, Prompt me. <laughs> you, the most diverse set of mammals in the world is found in the, the region uh, called the Mato Grosso. It's just outside of the major uh, mm -hmm. rainforest area of Brazil. It's, it's sort of a pampas region, right? It's, it's, it's a transition between the pampas and the... And the you mean uh, it's arrogant? 
It's an yeah. arrogant, very arrogant. There's not a lot of rain. No, 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 stop it. <laughs> <laughs> it's P A M P A S. <laughs> it's where all the gauchos play. So, so the the megafauna there, it's quite amazing. They have giant anteaters and giant armadillos, and they have lots of other large mammals, and all of them are infected with Trypanosoma cruzi. All of them. The aardvark, the that's an African animal. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to mention aardvark. I meant to say that's okay. anteaters and and yeah. the, the tree toad, uh, the tree, the two toed tree sloth, which is I know hard to say, also is infected. And a lot of people were using them as experimental animals back in the states. Yeah, and they would have to yep. make sure that they didn't carry Chagos disease, and of course they did. So they were they were dangerous animals. So getting rid of the reduvid breeding sites for people doesn't eliminate the infection in a zoonotic sense. Got it. So we're still at risk from the infection, even though, like I mentioned, the, the yeah. southern portion of South America is now declared free of Chagos. Yeah. I mean, one last thing that sort of came to me while I was um, listening uh, about the anteaters <laughs> was that um, in a lot of parts of the world, Chagos disease is, is felt to be um, a disease with a stigma. It's right. a disease of the poor poverty. Yeah, and poverty. of poverty. And so, so it, you right. have to have a little bit, of, I should say, cultural sensitivity. If we have physicians out there who yeah, are yeah, listening yeah. And, yeah. and are excited to make this diagnosis now and yeah. start thinking these people are from endemic areas, I may want to test. I don't think all our diagnosis should come from the blood bank people. Um, you want to be a little careful in how you present this um, diagnosis because here you're going to suggest potentially a very unpleasant sure. therapy. Sure. Right after you've told someone, you know, that you've disparaged them and accused them of having this disease of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've come here to the U.S. in many cases. They sure. feel like they're really doing well and That's they're proud true. of that. And you don't want to be, oh, you know what, you've got this disease that, you know, you've got because yeah, yeah. you are a poor rural person. That's right. That's right. Um, it's just sort of a sensitivity that's important in engaging the patient. Yep. So the, the African trypanosome infection is totally different disease, right? It's sleeping sickness. Totally different. In fact, <laughs> the thing that makes it totally different is that the trypanosome in the South America, the American trypanosomiasis, is a tissue-dwelling parasite for mm -hmm. the most part. When it penetrates the cell and rounds up into the amastigoid form, it's intracellular from that point on. The African trypanosome never does that. It stays in the blood the whole mm -hmm. time. Correct. Or it gets in the central nervous system through the cerebrospinal fluid, but it never goes into the tissues. That's a huge difference. And what's the vector for that? Over one? there, it's the setsy fly. Setsy fly. Right. So you can imagine, I think we talked about this too a little bit, where in, in Jurassic <laughs> times, mm -hmm. when South and Central America and, and, and Africa were connected, yeah. and then as they started to drift apart, you can imagine how this varied with sure, regards sure. to speciation and of vector uh, selection. It's and old and new world monkeys, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. All right. Is that it for this one? Fascinating stuff. We have a, we have a <laughs> no, really, stuff. it never ceases to bring out stories about sociology, about geopolitics, about eating habits, about yeah. whether you go to the beach and have a drink of this wonderfully tasting sugary solution <laughs> that might result in your death. I mean, these are tragic situations. They're not. I don't mean to laugh at these things. I'm just saying that we're... We are experts at this, and we still are amazed at how diverse and varied the information is about it. So we're, we're so pleased with these responses. I'm very pleased with these responses. That's a great set of All responses. right, Dixon is pleased. Yeah, Excellent. absolutely. All right, we have a paper. We do. It's, it is uh, a paper published in Journal of Infectious Diseases. It's called Targeting Filarial able like kinases, orally available food and drug administration approved tyrosine kinase inhibitors are microfilaricidal and macrofilaricidal. Get out. <laughs> you mean you kill off the big and the little at the Apparently. same time? Apparently. It's amazing. So um, Daniel pick this. Why did, did you pick this paper, Daniel? What I caught your eye here? You know, there were a couple things that caught my eye. Um, it was not the title. <laughs> 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 So th this was actually the editor's featured major article in the, mm. in the last edition of uh, the Journal of Infectious Disease. So the, the editors basically sort of pull this out and say, mm -hmm. hey, you should take note. And when you start to read the article, there, there's a lot of features of this that I, I really was impressed by. And um, so l let us sort of start and go through it and, and talk about that. But I should mention the authors. This is um, from a group down at the NIH. And Dixon actually reminded me, this is the second paper That's that right. has come out of Nutman's lab that we exactly. discussed. What was yeah. the other one? 
Um, it was on Loa Loa, as I recall. Okay. And we'll we'll go back and look it up. Yeah, Why should uh, we have to guess? No, no, no. It, 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 it was the, it was the one that had um, a lot of flow cytometry because Mario Roterer was one of the co-authors on that. Right. And, I'll look it up uh, while you're telling us about it. So yeah, we so will refresh he, our own memories as well as the <laughs> screens in front of us. <laughs> so they they start off with the central. They start off with the central problem yeah. is that we don't have a lot of alternatives when it comes to treating um, the neglected tropical diseases. And they point out um, for Loa Loa, there's this specter of resistance to albendazole and um, ivermectin. They also point out that Oncocerca has basically a single drug, ivermectin, that works for it. Correct. And so they're bringing up the issue that it would be nice if we had and some wait, other... Wait. Yes. How does it work? Is it a macro phalericide or a micro phalericide? The ivermectin. Yeah. Why don't you tell us? Because that is it's that a is micro phalericide, so it doesn't kill the adults. So you have to keep giving it until the adults die of old age, which is the reason why they have the ivermectin program to begin with, or mectazan. It's called yeah, mectazan. That's the yeah. mer- brand for it. So every year you have to give a dose of drug to everybody mm-hmm. to make sure that their microfilariae are killed, but the adults that make the microfilariae are not killed, mm-hmm. which is a big drawback for the treatment because it's a 20-year follow-up with lots of money spent for the drugs, as you know. Yep. And that's going to be key here. And that's compliance gonna, that's is huge. Key. By the way, it was TWIP 86. TWIP 86. Worms Loa, the immune response Loa. to mycobacteria. <laughs> it was Loa. The title says everything. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. It was a journal of immunology paper. Yeah, right? it was a good paper. It was a very good paper. We only do good papers, right? We only do good we papers. We try, anyway. Or excellent papers. We do. We only do excellent papers. That's right. And the other thing so they, they bring up Please. here, and th- this is actually, I think, a very important issue, is that in areas that have um, Loa Loa and... Um, oncocerciasis, when you try to treat these people um, with ivermectin, um, you can have some really severe neurological outcomes. You can have encephalopathy, you can have people dying. So in, in a lot of areas where it's been co-infection, they've just said, we're going to stop the ivermectin treatment, which is a little disastrous, right? So we've got these areas Eek. where they're, they're not treating people with, yeah. with oncocerciasis, people who might develop blindness, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, because they're worried about the co-infection. So, so there's a number of reasons that are sort of driving them to do this project. To look for more drugs, basically. They're, li- they're, yeah. looking, for a new, they're looking for an effective drug. Mm-hmm. I mean, we want to go ahead and we want to actually get rid of these diseases. Because another drug that's effective but very dangerous, too, is diethylcarbamazine. So DEC used to be the standard treatment, but it was a very toxic drug, and it elicited a lot of reactions. Like the Mazzotti reaction, as I recall. So they, they they leverage something that I think a lot of people sort of question why we do is, is we've done the full sequence of a lot of um, organisms, and people said that uh, why do you do that? It takes a lot <laughs> of time for and the money. most part, I agree with them. But <laughs> are, we, are we doing that just to check the box <laughs> to say, oh, we've done this now? Well, they actually um, they leverage that. They said, well, now that we have the whole sequence of these different organisms, let's scan yeah. the genome for potential drug targets. Mm-hmm. Bingo. And they go ahead and they find these tyrosine kinases. And they start looking a little bit more at the tyrosine kinases. And then they bring the ideas, you know what? We have drugs that inhibit tyrosine mm-hmm. kinases. Right. If this tyrosine kinase is essential for these parasites, mm-hmm. maybe we can use this already FDA-approved drug to actually target and kill well, who do we really want to kill? We want to kill the parents, yeah. right? Because <laughs> right. if you kill the parents, they can't have any more kids. This is all true. So the yeah. kids are what are driving you crazy. Right. But you can't just keep killing the kids because the parents will keep having new ones. Exactly. Yeah. So the kids drive you crazy. You kill the parents. They can't have any more kids. And we're all right. happy. Right. Sounds terrible. <laughs> Yeah, if you put it that way, Dan, I'm not sure we should air this episode. It's the name of the episode, Kill the Parents. <laughs> yeah, so they start off by doing these sequence um, analysis. And, and that's where sort of we have our, what do we call that, our silicon experiments, yes. where ahead of time they're trying to decide, you know, is, right. this, is this going to work? And then they go ahead, and this is the genius here is we know that there isn't a lot of money for getting these, call them orphan drugs or drugs for neglected tropical diseases right. through the pipeline. So they grab an FDA-approved drug 
off mm -hmm. the shelf. Mm -hmm. Look at that. And they start testing its ability to kill the... We'll, we'll right. shift from the parent rhetoric. We'll go to the Please. macro <laughs> filaria. <laughs> these <laughs> rotten like... little worms that live inside of our tissues. So, yes. Daniel, can you... These tyrosine kinases are of a specific class. So, we, yeah, we should probably bring that up. And Let's bring talk that. a little bit about that. Because, in fact, um, the, your, your laboratory, the Goff Laboratory, has a long history with this class of tyrosine kinases. Okay. Did you know that or not? You didn't know that? <laughs> I, I, they, you know, I go to the lab meetings, and yes. But I must say. It goes you, way back. Yeah, if you, go, if you look at Steve if you look at Steve Goffs, and that's that's who I work with, if you look at his list of greater than three hundred publications, mm -hmm. um, it, it's it's overwhelming. Right. And basically, you have to study all of science to keep up with Steve. So yeah, these are able tyrosine kinases, which yes. were first discovered in a retrovirus uh -huh. called Abelson murine leukemia virus in the Baltimore laboratory while I was there. Look at this. These guys worked on this. So this was a transforming retrovirus isolated initially from mice and uh, it causes tumors in mice. And it has picked up an, a cellular oncogene called ABL, A -B -L, which is named after the virus. But Abelson, of course, it's yes. a cellular gene that's involved in growth control and it's a tyrosine kinase. So it's involved in these cascades that regulate cell division and the virus picks it up, it becomes dysregulated, and it's overproduced in infected cells, and it yes. transforms them, makes them divide incessantly, and eventually they become tumors. Now, you, Daniel, must know of the involvement of ABLE in human disease, right? I know you're an infectious disease guy, but yes. you must know some oncology, right? <laughs> no, I'm actually, quite a bit, actually, I'm actually folks. Quite, quite fascinated with oncology. Uh, no, and actually the, the interplay between a lot of our infectious diseases and the increased risk of malignancies is particularly interesting. So what line. kinds of tumors are, is uh, C. able? So C. able, um, people may have heard of the Philadelphia chromosome. Is that a, like a sub or something? It, it is. It is. Cheese steak? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they take Velveeta and they melt it on top. Philadelphia no, chromosome, right? It is the Philadelphia chromosome. It's the chromosome of brotherly love. It's these two chromosomes coming together, chromosome 9 and 22. And what you have is you have the B cell receptor on the one chromosome, and that is chromosome 22, and the Abelson or Abel mm -hmm. tyrosine kinase is on chromosome 9. And they actually come together. And what you end up with is that the BCR, which is chronically active, is now making the tyrosine kinase chronically right. active. Which is bad. And this is, this is CML, chronic Chron myelogenous leukemia. Chronic and myelogenous. Yep. Why is it? My, what does myelogenous mean? You know, we, we talk about the different white cells, and there's, uh -huh. there's like lymphoid and myeloid. This is more Myelo of a myeloid. Okay. Bone um, which, is, which is interesting, right? Because we're talking about the BCR here. But. So it's an abnormal chromosomal translocation, which turns on this C. able constitutively. It's constitutively And then on. that's bad because your cells divide, and that's they a recipe undivide. for cancer. And yeah. wor this cr CML, where do you see it? In young people, old people, everybody? No, it's usually older people. Older people? Yeah. I mean, it can transform into these blast crises and these acute forms, but right. um, it's usually an older. So here's a great example of how they studied this mouse retrovirus that causes tumors in mice, <laughs> and it sheds light on a human disease. And who could have yeah. predicted that? Yeah. Another reason why you just have to let people study. Do Smart basic. people do what they want, that's including true. sequencing genomes. Which is what yeah, we're seeing here. Because you that's never true, know yeah. what you're going to get out of no, it. No, you are right. Please, folks, let science proceed. <laughs> let it be, as uh, the Beatles now, uh, would say. Now, Daniel, <laughs> yes. can you treat CML? Yes, you can. And you could treat it, a combination of different... And one of the drugs is one of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors, um, Imidinib, which we're going to see, which appears in this paper, or people may know it by the trade name. Are we allowed to use trade yeah. names? Gleevec. Gleevec. Yeah. And it's an antibody, right? It is. It's an a antibody. monoclonal antibody. I'll Dixon. Be darned. Incredibly successful, I understand, right? Yes. It's a camel derived yes. antibody? No. It's not a camel derived antibody. <laughs> well, I know. I it is not know. a camel. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Should we talk about camel antibodies? <laughs> yeah, we, eventually we should. <laughs> I, think I think we already did. We already talked about camel antibodies. We did. We had a long discussion. Dixon was frustrating in that one. I was amazed, actually, more than frustrating. I think this is a humanized monoclonal antibody. So you start with a mouse and you replace yeah, I, I enough residues to make it human like, and then you purify it and give it to people, and, and you get a good cure rate, uh, Daniel? Is that the. the 
Um, you do actually, um, and I should say it's this treatment is not just limited to CM, CML because um, a number of tumors actually have increased tyrosine Able. kinase activity. Um, mm. So I think there's renal cell cancers and a, a number of others. I think there's three or four now. That and then there's some more. There are newer ones. There's in, in addition to imidinidabib or whatever it is. Zatanib. There's others. And N- second, Nilotinib third generation. And, yeah, there's even more. And Steve tells me they're better when you get some resistance against the original. Uh-huh. These are better against. Uh, yeah, that is always the amazing thing. Is they, the uh, unfortunately the tumors can mutate so that they're basically a point mutation which makes them resistant to these inhibitors and the mathematicians claim it's just you know you've got so many cells and one of them it seems a little fishy to me so basically you you administer this monoclonal and the monoclonal binds the able protein and prevents it from turning on the mitogenic cycle of the cell exactly so you're turning it so, down. but it's not against the active site of tyrosine kinase yeah, it's near the active site. I'm yeah, no, it's actually, yeah, yeah, it's actually so it's a binding steric into the... Yeah, 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 it's right in the active site. That's my understanding. In fact, and there's a mutation that can still function? Well, mutations, if, as you know, Dixon, don't function. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> An altered protein? <laughs> yeah, I mean, if, if, if you get a mutational event that changes the amino acid sequence yeah, it can in make the pocket... The, it can make the antibody less reactive. But, but it can also make the functional. able protein still less functional. reactive. Yeah. It, 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 the protein is still functional. That's why it's a problem, right? Because you have resistance and these people, they have relapses, right? Yeah. But so it, sure. it's a tyrosine kinase. It puts phosphate onto uh, tyrosine uh, residues, which is an important part of signaling in the mitogenic pathway, right. which mm-hmm. is the signaling pathway that tells cells when to divide. Yep. Most of our cells don't divide because it's not good to divide. Indeed. Except when you've stopped growing, then, you know... <laughs> If you keep dividing, that then you accumulate mutations and you become a tumor. Right. Okay. So what did they do with these uh, antibodies, Daniel? Well, they went ahead and uh, tested them to see um, basically suri- survival curves. And they're using uh, Brugia Malay here in figure two that yeah. I'm looking at. And you can put these in culture and you can actually put them add the drug and see if they die. Is that basically Basically, it? that's what they're doing. They're basically yep. drugging and seeing if they, uh, if they kill them. So you could do this experiment, Dixon. <laughs> my mouth just fell open and my jaw hit Would the, you is this something you'd like to do at the ground um, that's a leading question it would take a long time for me to answer it right now the answer is no <laughs> is that your kind of experiment <laughs> no it wasn't I didn't do that kind of work for my own research I, did, did I you worked, culture uh, organisms I did sometimes I did yes of course did, I did. you add drugs to them uh, occasionally I did that okay then this is your kind of experiment. <laughs> well, no, I, I don't say I don't approve of this. Of course, I think this is wonderful work. But I want to see this go back into the animal, too. Uh, Daniel, are the drug levels physiologically or pharmacologically so they, relevant? They have, and actually, you know, that was another thing I loved about this paper. In the, in the discussion, and I don't know, either they did a great job or they had some great reviewers that helped them <laughs> do a great job. But they, they bring up, like, every question I had was mm. in the discussion. Um and basically what they say is we can achieve these are the these are the levels mm-hmm. so they show these are the levels that it takes to basically be macro filler cytokine basically to kill the adult filarial right. worms and these can be achieved <laughs> from just a single 400 milligram dose of the glevac and this is a, and this is in people this is given orally right this is given yeah. orally and orally. and there are there are side effects but the side effects don't really tend to show up to like 3 or 4 weeks you know mm-hmm. on to therapy this is an so antibody single, that's given orally yeah, yeah. Isn't that interesting that's even more interesting isn't that great that's yeah, very so it must be in a capsule that lets it go through the <sighs> stomach right so that it doesn't get digested, digested in yeah. the gastric um, acid yeah so they say we can give one we can give one pill one 400 milligram pill which is a reasonable dose we can achieve the levels that we've showed shown that we need to achieve um it could actually go up to 800 milligrams a mm-hmm. day after mm-hmm. you approve they're not sure that they need to do that right um and then and then what they're sort of interested is can you just do a single dose can you do yeah. a single dose in all these areas particularly areas where there's co-infection and kill the adults of these basically end the cycle not have to go back year after year but a yeah, single, yeah, dose. Right, single dose. So Pretty Tom thin. Nutman is a world-class nematologist. Mm. Tom Nutman, the Tom author, Nutman. senior author on this yes, paper. Yes, he is, yeah. yes, he is. But there's a paradigm with regards to nematodes in general, and I'm sure Sinoiditis falls into the same paradigm, and that mm-hmm. is that once the adult worm is produced, 
the number of cells remains constant at that point. It, it, it doesn't mm-hmm. need to make any more cells. So if tyrosine kinases prevent cell division, I can understand how it could interfere with microfilarial production, but I'm, non, I'm confused and, and intrigued as to the mechanism of action of anti-tyrosine kinase activity against an adult nematode mm-hmm. that is not undergoing de- uh, on-demand cell division. The number of nerve cells are set, the number of muscle cells are set, the number of gastrointestinal cells, excretory cells, cuticular generating cells, that's all fixed, and the number don't vary after that. So how would tyrosine kinase work against the adult? The inhibitor, why is it working? Yeah, yeah because that's a good question. I would I like know. to know the answer to that. Because yeah, so they, so I'm they go sure into Tom that. is intrigued as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah so they go into that, and part of it is they, they borrow work that was done in the schistosome um, field, and they realize these are actually involved in maintaining this protective outer sheath, right? Uh-huh. And so yeah, when you block it... Yeah. The sheath falls apart, and they have some wonderful cuticular uh, synthesis is ongoing. Yeah, so yeah. it's a dynamic process. Okay, and so they actually have in you know, figure five, they I they have this that. wonderful EM where you can actually see the destruction yeah. of the sheath. That's right. So they've got this. But uh, that's microfilaria. Yeah, that's micro. And so you want to you want to see the same. The adult, you want to see this figure. What part of the adult is being affected by yeah, this drug? I don't think they yeah. address that antibody. here. No, they don't. They, no. It's a good they, question. They postulate that it's good the question. same. But yeah, so. but you're right. It would be nice. Let's let's see an EM. Let's let's mess with the adult. I like the, I, I think like it's. That I, I'm yes, wondering if the technical good. issue. Can you grow the adult in these cultures? I mean, it no, just sort of is it going to be? It requires a host. So it may just be a technical challenge. It kills both. Right. That's the the observation. Both adults and the kids are both killed. So that's what we want. We do want the in adults. In the animal, give. you give the drug and they both die. Well, these are in cell. These are in in cultures. We don't. Know. I understand. Did they do an animal experiment? So this they talk about in the discussion, right? So so this is all great. So now we're going to move into you know permissive animal models yeah. with this pathogen. And so they say, I, I just got a quote. Um, they say, given the widespread use and over a decade of safety data, moving directly to human studies to assess the effects of imatinib and dasatinib in filarial infections is warranted, particularly because there's no good permissive animal models oh, for the pathogenic w. ovovulus, W. Bancrofti, Loa Loa. So in Brugia Malayi, they can use jerds or other, <laughs> other weird <laughs> mammals to accept <laughs> the uh, infection. So did they, I'm sorry, I didn't read this article as carefully as you did. <laughs> That's did okay. they actually try the drug out in a GERD infection no. to make sure that the adults are killed too? So where did they come up with the finding that it's a macro filler side? Yeah, where's where's their data on the macro filler well, side? Exactly. That's figure two. They have macro and micro filaria. It's in the title. Yeah, it's in in figure two. They do it in culture. And they just oh, they take them. the adult woman, put it in culture from, yeah, an, ad, exactly. from an animal. Exactly. I, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're not really, I mean, okay, cu- culture is sort of, I guess, a hard, we think of culture as getting it to replicate. It's just they're putting right. it there, and right. then they're exposing it, and boom, it's, it's dying. Oh, okay, fine. Now, they um, do note that uh, in, in a mouse model of schistosome, this, these drugs don't clear the parasites. Right. But they say that's okay because the, the able proteins are different. Exactly. <laughs> right? yeah. But exactly. I think... So the, the key and they did humans, a genetic analysis to show that, too. That, that was very things, cleverly done, I thought. The, 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 I think the key now, if they're going to really go into humans, yeah. which it just sounds like yeah. they can, the, the question is, you know, in, in people with CML, you give this drug orally, and it goes to the right place, obviously, to mm-hmm. cure that disease. Will this go to the right place to uh-huh. take care of Another good question. Yeah, will you get levels parasites? in the right, Another yeah, great in the right, right place. Right. So that's always the key with a drug. You can show in culture that it wipes out whatever virus or bacterium or parasite you're looking at, but it's got to go to the right place in the animal. But they right? mentioned that they gave it orally. Yes. So these parasites... Most of them. Mm-hmm. It's called lymphatic filariasis. Okay, lymphatic. They're in lymph filariasis. nodes, right? Or in the lymphatic vessels. So, so is it going to get there? It's That's the question. It got to get there. So Dixon, they, and maybe Daniel, they say this is 100% bioavailable after oral administration. Mm-hmm. What, what does That's that amazing. mean? It yeah, goes to you the, can, 100% compare. goes to the right place? No. So you're... you're here looking at the dose of drug you give peripherally and yeah. the level you're going to achieve in the blood. The and that, that would become, that would right. so the second would issue be the issue of you, tissue penetration and tissue yes. levels. So oh. for the blood, for this, in people, when you give them, all of it gets in, after oral administration, it all gets in the blood. 
That's what they're saying. 100%. Or the lymphatics. Yeah, and they do they do actually go ahead and say that. They say even though they can reach the levels um, in the blood uh, and in the skin, mm. um, in the lymphatics or subcutaneous tissue, right, which is where some of these worms are going to reside, Most of it's adults. hard to know if you're going to, yeah, and where the adults are. It's hard to know, you know, the levels in those compartments. In Angocerca, it's even more problematic because they live in the subcutaneous tissue in a nodule. So, so they're not is, even in a vessel. This is not a given that it's going to work. Correct. All right. Okay. So if you were designing a clinical trial, Daniel and I had yeah. lunch today mm-hmm. and tried to brainstorm our <laughs> way through, okay, say we're Tom Nutman right now, and you're, you've got this exciting new finding, and you've got a human population that you can identify with a specific kind of lymphatic filaria or Oncocerca, either one of those two, where is the ideal area in the world to try out your first clinical trial? Where would you go? What disease would you attack to say, if we can cure this one, we can get them all? Because they've all got the similar kind of tyrosine kinase uh, proteins. Mm-hmm. So my choice would have been someplace in India. Yeah. And I would be treating Uchereria bancrofti, mm-hmm. which causes hydrocele. Right. Uh, testicular enlargement, and there's a huge endemic center there, mm-hmm. and <clears throat> they have very few options for treatment. There's a surgical intervention strategy, which is okay, not great, and so you could use those people as your test subjects. Of course, they have to get permission and everything else, yeah. but it sounds like... So would you take... <coughs> there are different stages of this highly advanced is exactly so which right. ones are you going to so oh, I you we start off with the most advanced because <laughs> really? those are the people that have the least chance of successful intervention but it may be too late no but right. you'd still know whether the adults were can you reverse them. this swelling by getting rid of the parasites well you remember when you talked about Wolbachia? Yeah? mm-hmm so these parasites have Wolbachia inside yeah, of them. If you, if you give antibiotics. If you kill the adults. You kill the parasites. You kill right? the parasites. So that you'll keep down the inflammation then. So would you do a, a placebo-controlled, double-blind trial? You have trial to do that addiction? first. You have to do that first. An antibody of a different specificity to begin with, just to make sure that that per se is not doing it. But then I would, I would go after the hydrocele um, uh, lymphatic filariasis victims that have enlarged testicles and that have no hope for treatment. And that's the first group I would work on. And, and the way you would know you succeeded is not only will you kill the microfilariae, because mm-hmm. they'll disappear right away, right? But over time, they won't come back because the adults are now dead as well. So then what do you do? Because when you kill an adult worm, you get a host tissue reaction because the adult worms are keeping the immune system at bay so you've got these lymphatic vessels. They're all open when the adults are alive. Right. When they die, that's when they close off, and that's when you get these mm-hmm. problems. Yeah. So you're going to have to <laughs> you can make come it up worse. with a steroid. You can make it worse. You might make it worse. So you have to come wow. up with a steroid-based post-treatment mm. scenario that eliminates the inflammation due to the dying right. worms because that's right. basically what the inflammation is all about. And, of course, from the Wolbachia also, yeah. as we recall from Alcazarca. But it's a tricky slope. You know, he's got a great beginning here, but I'm sure he's yeah. pulling out what a few remaining hairs Tom has, Takes. trying to find out where he best can apply this to make sure that he has a success. Right. Because once you have a success, then you can start building on that. Dixon, I have a tricky question for you. Oh, Lord. <laughs> Another tricky question? <laughs> Try me. <laughs> so these monoclonals that inhibit C. able. Would they be useful as antivirals against viruses that carry C. able? It might work. It might just be crazy enough to work. <laughs> That's your answer, huh? I would. What about you, Daniel? What do you think? Just thinking about the localization. Well, they're That's intracellular. A tricky, That's a tricky question. Yeah. Remember, viruses. I want you to make an antiviral that inhibits virus replication. Yeah. Somehow you have to get that inside the cell then. Yeah. The answer is no, because right. oncogenes are not needed for virus replication. Ah. Uh-huh. They're just things that are picked up accidentally, and they happen to transform cells, but we oh, want to inhibit the virus. I see, I see your point. It's not going to do it. Got it. I, was, I told you it was a tricky that question. That was a, you know. Very tricky. Made, 
<laughs> I like thinking of tricky questions. It exceeded my knowledge level. I, I was going to go with the actual trial to treat Loa Loa. I thought that was the natural extension of the next yeah. step. Find Loa, a population, Loa. treat Loa Loa, make sure it works, and then because because we really want to get these filarial eradication programs up and running in areas of the world where there's right. basically been shut the down. The problem with Loa Loa, and I'll raise this one also, okay. is that like Anca Circa, it lives in the subcutaneous tissue. It's not in the blood. It's not in the lymphatics. It's in the subcutaneous tissue. Mm-hmm. So achieving therapeutic levels at that point might be very difficult. Understood. I mean, the micro- microfilaria will be attacked no problem because they're in the blood. That's how they're picked up by the vector. But the adult worms, mm-hmm. that's a tough one. I would pick one that lives in a bloodstream or in, in the lymphatics to begin with. And I think the lymphatics would mm. be Wuchuria bancrofti. Sort of lower hanging fruit. Work lower out for the fruit. lower. The low hanging fruit. <laughs> That's very good. Is that good, a good title? Way. Why not? <laughs> Loa hanging fruit. Go to the lowest hanging fruit. All right, let's do a clinical case, Daniel. Do you have okay, one for I, us? I have another one. This is not um, from Peru, right? No, this is not from Peru. Uh, this <laughs> was, yeah, I have a bunch of cases sort of prepped up. I don't know if I'll ever present any of the ones from Peru. Probably. Who knows? This was a uh, this was another clinic patient. It's a 33 year old Chinese male living in Chinatown here in New York City, and he comes comes to the clinic with several months of on and off watery diarrhea. He also reports headaches, but no other constitutional symptoms. He's tried reflexology and chiropractic therapy, but nothing has so far helped. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so should we, he's a 39-year-old ch- Chinese male. Where has he been? Um, he's been... Um, he's been out of... Uh, let, let me see here. He tra- He's actually traveled quite a bit. Um, he he lives in Chinatown, as I mentioned, in New York, but he's traveled to Chile um, and uh, several areas outside of the city. Yeah, so he hasn't just stayed here in New York. He's been out of South America. And he's a recent uh, immigrant? Um, let me see if we know when he immigrated. No, he actually immigrated um, quite a while ago. Okay. Quite, yep. a, quite a while ago, when he was younger. Um, so he's mainly grown up here in the U.S. He so was. You, you read that while I was busy searching to get back on where, to where you TWIP 94. Should I remind you? This would you please, would you please reiterate? <laughs> <laughs> 33 years old. So 33 year old Chinese oh, male, Chinese. born in China, born but in came China. over here when he was a young man. Okay. He lives in Chinatown. Okay. Uh, he came to the clinic with several months of on and off watery diarrhea. He's got a headache, but otherwise feels well. He, as we found out, he has traveled quite a bit. He goes down to um, Santiago, Chile. Oh, wow. Um, okay. Does and he, he actually he... was down there a few months before. What does he do there? Um, he goes there for fun. For fun. Goes there for fun. <laughs> what does that mean, Daniel? <laughs> uh, what kind of fun are we talking about? <laughs> Vincent's usually the one who asks yes, these important he questions. Is. Kind of fun, yeah. <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, recreational, um, nightlife type of fun. Oh, keep talking. Does he, does, <laughs> he do, does he take drugs while he's there? Uh, let me see. Um, marijuana, stimulants, alcohol, tobacco. Yes. Does he have sex? Yes, oh. he does. With which uh, gender? Does Anyone he who's willing. Oh, I see. Interesting. Yes. He actually says multiple partners and, I quote, many styles. Many styles. styles. <laughs> wow, interesting guy. <laughs> he does a lot of drugs and And the only thing sex. he has is watery diarrhea. He says, <laughs> when, when, asked, when asked for the number of sexual partners, he says it must be greater than 50. Uh, on each trip? <laughs> oh Total. Goodness gracious. Total. Well, so he's very sexually active. So we're not going to judge that. I'm not judging. It's no, no, just of it's not not judgment. impressive. But we are um, trying to look for a cause for this man's symptom. Well, yes. symptom. sounds like an infectious disease, Dixon. It certainly it does, doesn't it? Sexually acquired, perhaps? No, not, not necessarily. necessarily. So it he does might be a red herring, basically. That's okay. We like yes. red herring. So he does, have, do. he does have some interesting past medical history yes. that, that we, we get. Um, two years ago, he was diagnosed with a chronic viral infection. Which mm-hmm. one? HIV. Uh, huh. um, oh, he has AIDS, huh? He has, he has a CD4 uh, count of 685. Currently, his he, viral load is non-detectable. He was diagnosed two years so previously. He's on, he's on antiretrovirals? He is. He's on um, 
uh, Abacavir, Tenofovir, and Norvir Prezista. All right, triple. So he's on triple therapy for his HIV. He's well controlled. He had a history of syphilis that was treated six years ago. He had a rhinoplasty, nose job in the past. Doesn't have any um, medication allergies. His family history is negative. He is an architect. Is he single? Single, but lives with his family, his uh, parents. He's an architect. He's an architect. Um, doesn't have any pets. Doesn't report any animal exposures. Sounds like he's an architect of his own destruction. Oh, I'm taking judgments, aren't you I? You are, I'm actually. sorry. I, I withdrew yes, that. That was... Yeah, it's okay. I'm not passing judgment. I just wanted to say an architect of his destruction. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, we all are, aren't we, Dixon? I mean, you... We have sown within us the seeds of our own You drive out west. That's you looking that. for trouble. Because really? you could have a car accident, right? Of course. Yeah. All right, so... Um, I should mention on exam, he's, um, you know, he's a febrile, good vital signs. Um, he actually looks quite well. There's nothing localizing. Just watery diarrhea exam. for two. It's weeks. just this watery diarrhea that just won't Water go away. And headaches, right? Diarrhea, and the headaches. Right. Yeah, it could be from dehydration or something like that. Though. And did this this coincided with a trip to Chile, apparently. He right? mentions he mentions that this happened a few months after a trip to uh, to Chile. Okay, and um, does he did he eat anything unusual there? Um, he's an adventurous eater. But um, he doesn't doesn't mention anything, you know, in particular. All right. Y- anything else, Dixon, that you need to ask? Do you have clues? My wheels are turning, but I I don't want to spoil the whole thing by asking too wanna. many questions. I think. Okay. We should wait. Yeah, and I'm not going to give you guys any more any more oh, lab thanks. tests or anything. Because they're going <laughs> to. Well, no, I mean. <laughs> yeah, right. No, no, no. I think that's where the answer. So is, So th- this obviously. may be a question of people writing in with the differential. Right, right. There may be a, I mean, there and there, there is a lot of possibilities that could present this Many. chronic, several month on and off watery diarrhea. So when he goes to Chile, how long does he go for? Um, he goes for a week at a time, and he has fifty sexual partners in a week. No, no, he's had greater than fifty <laughs> sexual partners lifetime. so far in his life. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, this guy's a week would be. Active. Holy, cow. I don't know. I mean, some some people probably could. Fit, I'm sure they do, know. but it's just um, a lot. Yes. Well, he's thirty three, and he's a young guy. All right, a lot of, I'm thinking a lot of things too, but you know, I think I think viral all the you time. You do, don't you? You know, you do. And How that, could you help not? <laughs> yeah, this, well, yeah, you know, yeah, this could be viral. You know? No, and it is, and, and that I think is always the interesting thing when we we come on this show is that it, it's I think somewhat easier when we've ruled out every bacteria, fungus, virus, and we're limited to just parasites. So hopefully that helps. But you know, as we know, worldwide the number one cause of diarrhea, it's viral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But was there it? are parasites that cause diarrhea. Many, many, there, many. There are. Many, many, many. Many, many There many. are at least three. <laughs> <laughs> no, there are more than three, Daniel. Yes, there many are. Many more than three. All right. Many. I think that's all we need I here. think that was a quote of, from Barnaby, my son. <laughs> There's a lot. At least three. At least three. That's right. <laughs> Sounds like the way the Eskimos count reindeer. They count them one reindeer, two reindeers, Many, Many reindeers, reindeers, and they don't distinguish after that. All right. It's kind of interesting. You want to do a couple of emails? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. All right. I just move. And I'm going to correct. Now. I'm going to say Alaskan natives because apparently Eskimo is not considered a. Yeah, no, that's true. That's not a real designation any longer. Should have said Aleuts. <laughs> so, do you want to do Steve Wrights? We should, if you'd you. like, yeah, if you'd Steve like me to, uh, please. Okay, Steve, Steve Wrights. Good afternoon, all. I hope I'm not too late. My name is. David, I won't read his last name, I am currently a research technician at Mass General Hospital. I am interested in becoming a parasitologist and figured listening to your podcast would be a great way to continue my already powerful attraction to the parasitic world. I am going to venture that the parasite in the case study is none other than Diphilobothrium lato. And I'm, am I reading the right that's fine. Email? Yes, you read that. It's okay. The, the Diphilobothrium latum pacificum slash latum, also known as the salmon tapeworm. The reason for selecting this parasite is due to the symptoms that our patients suffered, nausea, abdominal pain, vomiting, fever, as well as the ubiquitous nature of the parasite found along the entire northern hemisphere. The fact that none of her other friends suffered symptoms is also a clue to the culprit, according to Schultz et al. Four out of five cases can be asymptomatic, Diagnosis includes identifying eggs in the feces. Treatment includes praziquantel, 
although not FDA approved. The weather in Boston is an extremely balmy 88 degrees Fahrenheit with a 50% chance of 50% humidity. Sincerely, David. So this is the same David who guessed the uh, Chagas and said, yeah. I'm sorry, I got the fish one wrong. No, it's okay. Hey, the next one is a question for Dixon, so maybe you should continue reading. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. Say, hey, Twippers, looking forward to your next podcast. They seem to be a long way apart <laughs> once one has caught up. <laughs> this is all true. Just a quick question for me, Dixon. I was about to listen to a webinar on a new Lyme disease vaccine, and there at the start is the usual picture of a tick. Looking at the loathsome creature, I find myself wondering... What is their ecological function? If they were all to disappear tomorrow, would it be anything other than a blessed relief to everything but the diseases they carry? <laughs> I can usually think of something good to say about most creatures, but these seem to have no function other than to cause suffering. Pure parasite with no redeeming features. I wonder if Dixon knows of any good purpose they might have. Maybe it's just to slay animals that don't have any larger predators. But it seems to me that they are pure pestilence that the world would be well rid of, and it really is against my nature to say it. Even the dreaded mosquitoes provide food for a wealth of other creatures, but ticks, a few birds like oxpeckers may feed on them, but <laughs> I bet more feed on them than they catch themselves. Well, the answer, you gave the answer, uh, and the answer is uh, parasites are population controllers for large ecological regions of the world and ticks are a great vector for those uh, parasites which control populations of things like herds of gnus and uh, I'm sure rhinoceri at one time were more numerous than they are today uh, and you can think of lots of other animal species that are susceptible to diseases that are carried by ticks so so the, the fact that they carry diseases it doesn't mean that they don't serve a purpose in nature. And I think their purpose is to transmit diseases that have a role in population control. So I found an article called, What Good Are Ticks? <laughs> Great. <laughs> and it said they do serve an important role in the ecological system. They've been around since the Cretaceous. Right. They've been, they were probably the bane of dinosaurs. The yeah. oldest known fossil tick was discovered in New Jersey. Did you know that? Really? Yeah, and it's in called, amber? In amber, and it's called Carlos Jersey Eye, 90 million that? years old. How about that? So why do we need ticks? They're food for other animals. Not so much so. Uh, they are a food source for animals that forage for sustenance in places where ticks live. Oh, okay, second, ticks host a remarkable variety of other organisms, right. like microparasites. Right. They carry viruses, bacteria, protozoa, other microscopic. Well, we'd prefer that they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> in the grand ecological scheme right. of things, these are part of the diversity of life on Earth. Ask the virus that lives within the tick why we need the tick. That's a right, great right. Yes. And third, by virtue of their blood draining and disease causing ways, yeah. ticks help control populations of larger that's hosts. Right. That's right. Ticks and that's right. That. So there's a wonderful New Yorker joke this week that just came out in this week's New Yorker. The cover shows a, a mouse and a cat. And it's a paradigm for the stock market. And you see the jagged line of the stock market going down, and the mouse mm -hmm. apparently rides this all the way down into the mouth of the cat. But then it starts to go back up again, and you can see the look of anticipation on the face of the cat and the look of horror on the face of the mouse. It's that issue of the New Yorker. Inside of that, there's a joke, and it's called TikTok. It's like a host show like we're doing right now. TikTok. Between ticks. And I don't know if we can find the joke right now online, but it's a very funny joke. I'll bring it in, and we can well, scan I it. Look at when, well, uh, Daniel does the email from Morgan. Right. Let me do that. Morgan writes, Dear TWIP friends, this is my first time writing to you after discovering TWIP and the rest of the Twix series last fall on iTunes. I greatly enjoyed all of the Twix podcasts, but TWIP is without a doubt my favorite. <laughs> like many of your listeners, I too am enjoying the new and improved format with the case studies and the inclusion of Dr. Griffin. He brings a vibrant new energy to your discussions, <laughs> and his insights and stories about parasites from his perspective as a medical practitioner bring a new level of fascination and entertainment to the show. As an amateur entomologist, I have especially enjoyed episodes involving medical entomology, particularly enjoyed TWIP 28 with Dr. Robert Wads. Okay. Do you think it would be too corny if I said I wanted to put a bug in your ear encouraging you to include an occasional guest entomologist on <laughs> TWIP? I do not have a guess at this time for the recent TWIP 93 mystery case, but I do have a question for you. 
One recurrent topic on TWIP is the acquisition of certain parasites by eating certain meats or raw undercooked meats. What about insects? Mm -hmm. With entomophagy on the rise, should we begin concerning ourselves with parasitic infections we might get by eating insects? While many insects have their own parasites, are there any human parasitic infections we could acquire only via the consumption of insects versus transmission via insect bite? How appropriate, right? I right on the money. Right on I the mean, money. this is like a follow up question to the per, yeah. Yep. This is you could eat reduvid bugs. You can. Or is this the sort of thing we will only begin to learn with time and experience as more people become comfortable with the idea of eating things like cricket flour and cockroach kebabs? Yum. Advocates of entomophagy claim that insect protein is healthier than the protein obtained from beef, chicken, pork, etc., and that it is more green to raise insects for food than it is to raise cows, chickens, pigs, etc. But I am curious if humans can expect to encounter parasites in their undercooked caterpillar sushi, <laughs> if there is even such a thing, just as we do in undercooked meats. I have not done enough reading to know whether or not the statements about health and the environment are accurate, but I like to think that if they are, people will eventually catch on to entomophagy as part of the green movement and transition to a diet that includes insects. As a vegan, I would also encourage skipping the whole entomophagy thing and transitioning directly <laughs> to a plant-based diet but tend to think of entomophagy as a baby step for a culture that will someday hopefully cease eating animals altogether. But for a new experience, next time you're in D.C., try Oyamel Cochina Mexicana for their right. chipolinis, yeah. wakakan grasshopper tacos, margaritas, and cool decor. <laughs> this can be done before or after visit to the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History's Insect Zoo. Right. On an unrelated note, but to provide you another bit of color to add to the diverse tapestry of that is your listening audience, I am a 27-and-a-half-year-old student attending community college after a seven-ish year hiatus from school. Guess what I'm interested in studying? Hmm. If you guessed entomology, you are correct. I also work full-time as a legal secretary, part-time as a public relations director for a local small animal rescue, and a mom to a house full of animals, big and small. <laughs> my daily commute involves a bus ride followed by a ferry ride, or oh a ferry ride followed by a bus ride, depending which way I'm going. So you can imagine how TWIP has become a wonderfully welcome addition to iTunes Listening Library. <laughs> TWIP has also become my default listening selection for summer Sundays spent relaxing on the sands besides the Atlantic Ocean in Virginia Beach. How cool. The weather this morning in Norfolk, VA, is unnaturally <laughs> pleasant for this time of year with the temperature around 23C with 85% humidity. Oh, wow. A bit of rain around daybreak and more forecast this afternoon. No worries, though, as the weekend calls for plentiful sunshine on the beach. Thank you for TWIP and for your sensational efforts in edutainment. Keep up the good work. Cheers, Morgan. <laughs> P.S. I'd also like to mention that I find it highly entertaining when Vincent says Reduvid Buck. <laughs> <laughs> and would like to encourage him to say it on air at every given opportunity. Now, did you just put this in or did she really put this in, Vincent? No, I didn't. I would <laughs> never Regard do that. So regardless, could you just say it again just for... <laughs> regardless of its relevance to the current <laughs> conversation topic, such flair and enthusiasm in his pronunciation. <laughs> Vincent, you might appreciate the fearsome and magnificent Arlius Christatus. Oh. In the that next dog. event that there is such a thing as reincarnation, this is exactly what I want to be on my next go around. <laughs> Arilus Christatus. Ah. All right. Is that good? It's about an inch <laughs> Very long. good. About an inch long. Do you see Very that picture good. of the bug she sent? It's quite nice. I didn't see it, actually. Yeah, yeah. there's a link there. Reduvid. Reduvid. The Reduvid. Oh, that is a great <laughs> bug. Now, Dixon, you said you can get, you can acquire chagas by eating a reduvid, but that's known for humans. Yeah, we mentioned. You it said before. the dogs do it. Right? <laughs> no, no. It's so this. No, this is a drink the, that they make yeah. from crushed sugar. Correct. Cane. That has yeah. bugs so in several it, yeah. outbreaks in um, Brazil that's were really, right. and, it, and it's and funny some, some if you problem. ask people in Brazil, they'll tell you that's how you get chagas, and you know why they yeah. want to say that, right? Because you don't want to be like I'm a poor person living in a hut. I drag some of that fancy um, fruit juice. Right. You know. If people start to eat more insects, and I just don't think that's going to happen. I know, it, I know it's not going <laughs> to happen. But if it did, 
this would be manufactured using colonies of bugs that were free of pathogens, right? I don't know. Chocolate-covered crickets, right? You get down in Chinatown. I don't know yeah, where they're coming not, from. Those are coming from the wild. You catch them, right? <laughs> but if, you, if it were a big deal in one day, a source of protein for humanity would be farmed or grown in tanks and laboratories. So yeah, I've seen be a lot of discovery vert- vertical, bu- vertical bug farms, right? I, I've seen yeah. a lot of shows on it. Yes. You know, it's, it's quite an interesting <laughs> concept. You know, it, it, certainly insects have their own viruses, but they generally don't infect us, you know. But no. when you eat cabbage, for example, you are ingesting lots of viruses that infect insects that feed on the cabbage. Right. But they pass right through you. Mm-hmm. But the, the pathogens are the issue, and I, yeah. I, I, just, I just don't think we know, and it's only a matter of if this increases, but I don't think it's yeah. going up, as you say. <laughs> People are going to eat more yeah. bugs. Yeah. I think she's right. You go right to the plants. Yeah, just let's <laughs> just skip the bugs. All right, let me do one more. Yep. This is from Trudy, who writes, Dear Twip Trio. Say that three times fast. <laughs> twip Trio, Twip Trio, Twip Trio. Right. I can't do it. Just listening to the last Parasitic Podcast, one of my friends is very knowledgeable about commercial salmon fishing, uh-huh. In the Pacific Northwest, Alaska, he states that all the fish caught commercially is flash frozen About to assure food safety. I have been given the same assurance by others, food inspectors I knew from working in public health epidemiology also. Hmm. Although I have not sent in my opinions on case classification for the cases presented of late, I very much enjoy this feature of the podcast. I must add that a while back, a listener with my same first name wrote in to one of the three podcasts stating that she did not like This Week in Parasitism. <laughs> right. I mean, you remember that letter. <laughs> I am a different Trudy who loves learning more about diseases of all kinds. I also deeply appreciate the Urban Agriculture Podcast. Uh-huh. I listened to two other podcasts about infectious disease by Dr. Mark Chrislip to round out my hunger for discussion about pathogens. Hmm. I'm in the middle of the podcast, but had paused it just to write. One of the greatest challenges I dealt with when I investigated possible foodborne disease was getting a good food history. Mm -hmm. Now, however, many people using activity and diet trackers such as Fitbit, Apple Watch, and others using apps like MyNetDiary, Fitbit app, MyFitnessPal, etc., may provide information that is recorded at the time of consumption or at least daily. This information could truly flesh out a history and provide strong clues for a medical diagnosis. That's a good point. Yep. People do tend to record everything about their lives now on these portable devices, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So far, I've inspired at least one doc to consider the data these tools can provide. All the best from Naples, Florida, where it is a sunny, humid, 32C kind of day. (laughs) Trudy, who is a RN... Retired, but still licensed, so I can only case classify and not diagnose. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's wonderful little emoticons. There's one with a face mask and a microscope. Very cool. <laughs> um, so all fish is frozen. Well, she said all fish, commercial, all commercial salmon commercial. fish is frozen. Is all fish frozen, Dixon? No, of course not. No, absolutely not. Should um, it be? Oh, that's another great question. You know, you have to clean the fish first in order to uh, right. render it commercially viable because otherwise nobody's going to buy a fish that's got all the guts inside still. So if you froze them the moment mm. you caught them, although that would prevent the spread of these diseases into the muscle of the fish, I think it would be impractical. You'd have to have a ship with liquid nitrogen as part of its cargo, mm-hmm. and that's very bulky. It's easy to do a gutter fish. You just slice the belly open and no, boom, it comes right out, right? Of course. But that means you have to do it as you're catching And you're them. catching hundreds of and fish. And they catch a it's net a full at yeah. a time. And it's, it's, I don't think it's practical, frankly. So how do they do these salmon? They're, I don't know. I, 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 that was the first time I heard that. I wonder if they freeze it much later. But that wouldn't help, right? No. The waters well, that they're caught in in Alaska are generally very cold to begin with. So the hold of the ship contains ice. So they go down right down on the ice first. This would stop any migration of larvae from the gut tract into the muscle. Mm-hmm. The moment they're shipped back to the processing factories near the shore where they're unloaded, uh, I am not aware of the fact that they are are frozen in liquid nitrogen. I'm really not. So I'm I haven't seen here, a modern uh, salmon processing plant to, this, to give an at opinion. The salmon website, and they say we freeze our catch within hours. Wow. Is that enough yeah. time? I mean, a lot yeah. of the a lot of the yeah, so it would be. the salmon fishing has sort of become more. I'll say more big 
big yeah, yeah, business. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they have these massive ships where it used to be you had smaller operations, the canneries and everything were all on the shore. So people would come in and would go to the cannery. Now a lot of the stuff, the ships stay out there and all the processing is uh, actually occurring at sea. Um, and I think as we, we bring up a couple of things, say, let's say 99, almost 100% of the time it's in the GI tract. Um, hmm. You know, down in Peru, hanging out with infectious, we came up with the fact that every so often it'll actually be in the muscles. So it's you're not a hundred percent safe right. eating it right away. You're pretty close, um, but yeah, the, at some point, even if it gets out, if you flash freeze, you can still kill the parasite, even if it's that's already. Correct. So that's the advantage here. If you take your sushi, even if it wasn't processed great, if you can flash freeze it, yeah, you can kill the parasites, and you're not going to get anisakiasis. Exactly. Or Diphyllobothrium latum. Or anathostomiasis, let's say. Or you can go uh, on. And that would be... <laughs> <Yeah>. Trichinella <laughs> so, or... <laughs> and, and that's interesting. Some fish, right, like um, our ceviche here in the U.S. made from tilapia, that's not necessarily frozen. It falls uh, out of the... There are fish that tilapia might... Tilapia is a be, freshwater fish that would not probably be susceptible to this. Yeah. Tilapia is a freshwater fish? It is. It's from Lake Victoria in... Uh, in uh, Africa. Oh. So that's going to be your nathostomiasis issue. So you have different different parasites that's depending true. upon fresh versus right. salt. And where it's raised. Yes. By the way, Dixon, I did search for TikTok in the New Yorker. I did not find it. I'll bring it. Up. <laughs> but I did discover that there's a TikTok diner in New York City. So I think we should all go and do a trip there, right? The TikTok. All right, I'll bring the joke in. Diner. I will definitely bring the joke in. <laughs> All right, that's TWIP 94, and we're going to do another one in two weeks, right? We are. We are. Back yes, on we schedule. Are. Yes, we are. You can find it on iTunes and also on microbeworld.org slash TWIP. And if you have any questions or comments, please send them to TWIP at TWIV.TV. Daniel Griffin is right here at Columbia University Medical Center. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, pleasure as always. And welcome back. Thank you. So you're, you're here for a week, right? And then you're gone again? Yeah, and then I'm gone again. No, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> for a month? I'm here for like a month or two. Very good. We can get another twip in. Yes. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and medicalecology.com. Thank and you, Dixon. urban agriculture. What's that? I, we have to do one. Verticalfarm.com. <laughs> we haven't done one in a long time. Urbanag.ws. Thank you, Dixon. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. Good questions. I, I love doing this. When you're on the point, you're, you ask good questions. I love doing that. Thank you. <laughs> The implication is that I'm not always on the point. That's okay. I accept. <laughs> I would that. never say I accept that. that as a criticism. I, I, I really it. do. Did I say that, Dan? <laughs> hey, it's recorded, so yes. <laughs> I'm afraid you're. It was on record. implied. It was properly implied. <laughs> Improperly implied. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The wonderful music you hear in the beginning and the end of TWIP. It's called an intro and an outro. That's composed by Ronald Jenkies. You can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back real soon. Another TWIP is is parasitic. parasitic.